Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I, uh, I got to say, uh, before I get started, that um, I, I do a little bit of a flashback. And I think it was probably 30 years ago, Bill. Um, and I actually preached from right there. And it would have been the first time I had ever been asked to preach. Um, and it was a Sunday night. And I think it took me 12 minutes. Um, and so I promise it won't take me 12 minutes today. Um, I, I want to share with you um, uh, as we leave to go to the mission field, um, you don't generally um, you don't generally make those kinds of changes in the middle of your life unless God has really done a little bit of uh, I mean, the, the distance we had to go, right? I mean, um, God's worked in our hearts and we've seen some changes in our lives, but to make the difference between being a youth pastor at a church in Spokane, Washington, to think about living in Addis, uh, that, was a, that was a pretty big, there was a, there was a pretty large gap there that God had to kind of fill to, to get us to that point. I want to share with you um, uh, some of the scriptures that really began to lay on my heart um, this idea of missions. And so turn in your Bibles this morning to Daniel in the Old Testament. And I, um, I really honestly will tell you that the, these scriptures we're going to look at today from the Old Testament really probably had more to do with convincing me what missions, why we would do missions, uh, than many, maybe anything else, any other scriptures that, um, that I had studied or looked at or heard preached on. In chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, we have a story about three young men. Um, I've always grown up, and they were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, I'll tell you that in Ethiopia, uh, their national language is Amharic. Um, they have a tendency to look at the same words we do and just pronounce it just a little bit different. And so, um, I can't even begin, uh, I don't remember Shadrach and Meshach, um, but I love the way they say uh, Abednego. They say Abednego. Abednego. And I, it, it took me the longest time to, to figure out, what is that? Shadrach, Meshach, and who? Abednego. Um, so if I refer to him as Abednego at any point in the service, you'll know who I'm talking about. I just think it's kind of a fun way to say his name. Um, uh, so they, they love Bible names, and, and, but sometimes they have a little different spin on them than maybe what we're used to. So in Daniel chapter 3, we have the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three young Jewish men have uh, been taken forcibly from Jerusalem, from Israel, and are in Babylon. And they're serving, uh, they're serving the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And because of uh, just how smart they are, and I would say because of their integrity, the king has identified them as being, uh, you know, uh, needing some promotions, and they're gotten some promotions, they're fairly high up in the government. And they have some positions of, of authority and respect. And these three young Jewish men have found a place in the king's court. And, and they're, they're, that's where their job is. That's what their work is. And so then in chapter 3, we find these three men faced with this situation. Um, and, and we're going to look at um, how they react and why they react that way. So look at Daniel chapter 3, and I'm, I'm just going to start reading... Um, uh, through about verse 7 or so. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was um, three score cubits and breadth of uh, six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the, dedica to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Then the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. They stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, all kinds of music, that you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whosoever does not fall down and worship shall that same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, 
When all the people heard the sound of the cornet and the flute and the harp and the sackbut and the psaltery and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations and the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So we know the story and we get, begin to see this picture. And Nebuchadnezzar wants to do something rather grand. And he wants to put on a big show. And so he builds this um, image that he wants everybody to come and admire. As you're reading this, as you're reading this story, it's kind of interesting. He doesn't build an image of himself. And, and it would not appear that he builds an image of any one of his gods. It really just says he built an image. And he built this huge image and that can be seen from a long ways. And he's going to gather all these people. And he wants them to bow down and worship in front of this image. And I think that as you look at this story and maybe think about Nebuchadnezzar as you read a little further on in Daniel, I think that what his image represented was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Okay? This wasn't necessarily Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't an image of Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't one of his gods that Nebuchadnezzar worshipped. I think this image represented Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And so he gathers all these people, um, and he tells them, when the music starts playing, I want you to worship. Well, we know um, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship. As the story goes, someone has to go and tattle on them. They don't worship. Somebody else goes, oh, we got them now. And they go to the king and they say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these Jewish men, they're refusing to worship. When the music plays and everybody else bows down, these three men are still standing. The king gets incredibly angry. The king gets incredibly angry. He calls them in and he says, everybody else can follow a simple direction. Why can't you? What's about you that when the music plays, you don't just bow down to this, this image that, that I believe represents the grandness of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. He says, why can't you just bow down? He says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you one more try. Okay? Maybe, maybe you didn't get the directions right. You know? Maybe you just need a little bit of incentive. Okay? So I'm going to give you another try. And remember, if you fail again, if you can't figure out the right time to bow down and worship, there's a fiery furnace waiting for you. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego respond, and they said, you know what, we don't even have to try, we don't even have to, you know, you don't have to wait for the music to play, king, because we know what our response is going to be. We're not going to bow down. And they say, and Nebuchadnezzar says to them, what God can, can rescue you from my hand? And they say, our God can. And then they make a statement. It's really, it, it's kind of interesting because they say, our God can rescue us. There, there's no doubt in our minds. And then they say, but if he doesn't, let it be known, we will never worship your gods. Okay? So, I just want to make it clear from the beginning, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not have some prior um, vision from God with a promise that they would not die that day. They had no indication what was going to happen. They knew that God had told them not to bow down. They knew that God could rescue them. There was also that question in their mind, you know what, he may not. But if he does not, Nebuchadnezzar, know that that's not the issue, whether he rescues us or not. The issue is, who are we going to worship? And we will worship no one but our God. And so the story goes on, and, and we, we see that uh, the amazing rescue that day of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But I want us to go back, because at that moment, when they say, we're not going to bow down, Something was happening right there at that moment that convinced them this is the day that we stand and we either live or die according to God's pleasure. And, and at that point in time, I mean, it's not every day that you come to a point where you say, it does not matter today if I die or not, because this is the, this is the rock that I'm going to die on, that I'm willing to fight and, and to die for. And so these three young men have reached that point that day, and I think it's important for us to see what was happening on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon that day that was so critical. So I want you to flip back to Daniel chapter 1, because there's a couple other things that happen that I think, in my mind, really set the stage of why, that it really was something significant that happens in chapter 3. And, and I, want, I want to kind of try to explain that. In chapter 1... We, we find the story, Daniel, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, have recently come in from Jerusalem. And they're basically, they're going to school. And they're in Nebuchadnezzar's school. 
And Nebuchadnezzar wants to kind of uh, educate them. And he's going to figure out who the very best advisors are going to be. And he's going to put them to work in his, in his, uh, in his court. But he's going to make sure that they are kind of indoctrinated into the system. Okay? And so here's a whole bunch of young men from other places, not just Jerusalem. And they're all there. And, and they're going to be indoctrinated into the Babylonian system. They're going to get education. And, and then they're going to see who's really the best, the standout, that's going to be included in the court. So a couple of things happen. First of all, we see that Nebuchadnezzar is going to let these young men eat kind of the leftovers from his own table. And so they get a lot of rich food and the, and the wine and, and all these things that have been prepared for the king in excess. So the leftovers are going to go to these young men. And Daniel, he says, you know what? I really don't want, I don't want to eat that food. That, it, you know, and it, it doesn't say, it doesn't say that it was pork or that it was uh, prepared incorrectly. Uh, but I think that was Daniel's concern. You know, we have some dietary laws. The king's cook has no idea, you know, what. And I really would rather not um, uh, go against uh, Jewish dietary laws and eat what the king has provided for us. So Daniel goes to the, uh, the chief of the eunuchs, the prince of the eunuchs, who is in charge of them, and says, could you feed us something different? As a matter of fact, if you would just give us vegetables and water, we would be happy. And the man says, I can't do that, because if you start looking scrawny, or if you start looking pale, and the king says to me, why aren't you feeding these guys? Look at, you know, they're looking scrawny. You're not feeding them enough. It's my head that's on the table. And Daniel says, I'll tell you what, let's just do a 10-day test. Okay, so for 10 days, feed me and my friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the four of us, just feed us uh, vegetables and water. Give everybody else all the great stuff from the king's table, and, and after 10 days, let's just evaluate, and let's see. Do we look any worse than anybody else? And so he negotiates with the, the man that's in charge of the food and says, he makes this deal with him. Let's go 10 days, see what it looks like. Now, as the story goes, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all look just as healthy as anybody else, if not healthier, and they have begun to show themselves to be some of the wisest of these young men, and the man that's in charge of, uh, of their diet says, that's fine. You want vegetables and water, we're going to continue to feed them that. And then if, if you look a little bit, um, it actually says that he begins feeding all the young men the same thing. Uh, he begins feeding them all the same way. And, and so, here's this point of contention for Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We don't want to eat this food. We don't think this is the right thing to do. How are we going to handle this? What are we going to do about it? And Daniel says, you know what we should do? Let's just talk with the guy that's in charge, and, and let's negotiate. Let's try to strike a deal. Um, Daniel, at this point, does not go in and say, hey, look, buddy, I'm not eating this. I'll starve before I eat your food. I might die but I'm not going to eat your food. That's not the tact that Daniel takes. Do, do you see that that's not the hill he was going to die on? He, wasn't, he, he wanted to go in and he negotiated. And he made a deal with this man. He says, you know what, we'd really rather not eat that food. Is there some way around this? Could we just... And he finds the way and, and he gets what he wants, but, but he's going to negotiate. He's going to work the deal out. And he's not going to take that stance. Um, you know what, if it means dying, I'm going to die today because I won't eat what comes off the king's table. So there's another thing. These four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, they all have Jewish names. And all of their names have a meaning. There's a certain meaning behind the names. Um, uh, Shadrach his, is actually the Babylonian name he received. So Hananiah is the Jewish name that he was given by his Jewish parents. Hananiah means whom Jehovah hath favored. Okay, so young man, whom Jehovah hath favored is his name. His parents called him, you that Jehovah hath favored. So he goes to Babylon, and um, the king or somebody in charge of the school, he says, ah, we can't call you that. We don't like Jehovah. You know, we just destroyed uh, Jerusalem, and we proved we're more powerful than Jehovah. So instead, let's call you Shadrach. And Shadrach means inspired by the sun god. So... Rach, R-A-C-H, was the Babylonian name for the sun god. And so he gets a new name, Shadrach, which means you that are inspired by the sun god. All right? So Mishael was the name of um, uh, Meshach, was the Jewish name. 
And Mishael means who is comparable to God, only its Hebrew God is El. Um, and so I, I just let you know that I got a really nice study Bible that tells me this, right? I'm really not that. I, I, I'm a really good reader. Okay? So Mishael means who is comparable to God or who is comparable to the Hebrew God. So his name gets changed to Meshach, which means who is comparable to God, only it's who is comparable to the earth God, the Babylonian earth God. Okay? So his name gets changed from his Jewish background to now Babylonian game, name, recognizing Babylonian God. Uh, Abedna, <laughs> uh, Abednego, um, his name was Azariah, and it means whom Jehovah helps. Azariah, whom Jehovah helps. Um, his name gets changed to um, Abednego, <laughs> Abednego, and it means the servant of the fire god. Okay, so here's these Jewish young men. They've been taken from Jerusalem. They're new in Babylon, and they're new in this school. And this is one, just one more time where they're faced with, what are we going to do in this new city, in this new system, surrounded by these people, and they want us to take a name, they want to change my name, that used to mean, whom Jehovah hath favored, and they want to change it to, inspired by the sun god, the Babylonian sun god. Okay? All four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all received Babylon.